Hey everybody, here we are with our last uh, Bible video where we're going to talk about the book of Revelation and I'm going to try and give you a really quick kind of drive-by story of what the Bible says is going to happen at the end of the world. So the book is called Revelation. It's a revealing of the secrets of the future um, and that's basically the English translation of the word apocalypse. Apocalypse is a word that we're familiar with. Um, it means the end of the world. So Greek apocalypse, English revelation. It is written, it was written by John, who was one of the disciples of Jesus. And toward the end of his life, he gets arrested for being a Christian because Christianity was not popular in Rome. And he gets thrown in jail and it's from jail that he has this vision of the end of the world that he then writes down and it becomes the final book of the Bible. So here is how the vision begins. He sees seven golden lampstands appear. And in the center of these seven golden lampstands is Jesus. Jesus is wearing a robe with a golden breastplate and his hair is white and his eyes are blazing with fire and out of his mouth is coming a sword. Very, very symbolic, of course. And everything in Revelation you will find is symbolic um, and even archetypal. Jesus begins to speak. He says, don't be afraid. I know I look scary and weird, but don't be afraid. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. So he's saying, I am the beginning and I am the end. And I'm getting ready to tell you the story of the end. Look in my hand, I have some keys, and these keys are the keys to the abyss. And the abyss is another idea for what we might call hell. Now write everything down that I'm getting ready to tell you, and then the vision continues and John sees a door open into heaven. And as he looks into heaven, he sees God sitting on the throne and God is holding a scroll. There will be several very important scrolls in Revelation that contain important information that's being given to John. And this scroll is sealed up with seven seals. And an angel comes around and says, is there anybody here who is holy enough to open up this scroll of God and break the seven seals. There's nobody there until a bloody lamb appears. And everybody falls on their knees to worship this lamb because he's the only one holy enough to open up these seven seals and open up this scroll being held by God. The lamb, of course, is a symbol of Jesus, and we've studied that quite a bit, so that should be familiar to you. So now this lamb opens up the seven seals and the first four release the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. We've got a white horse um, ridden by pestilence, which means disease. And then we've got a red horse ridden by war who's carrying a sword, you know, ready to start the final battles of earth. And we've got the third one riding a black horse representing famine. And then we've got a pale horse ridden, ridden by death. And this is the beginning of the end. The fifth seal um, allows John to see the souls of all the people who have been killed for the sake of Christianity. And that, of course, is a really big deal for John because he himself is in prison for Christianity and is going to end up being a martyr. Uh, the sixth seal releases a bunch of earthly disasters like earthquakes and eclipses and a bloody moon. And with the seventh seal, everything gets quiet. Then an angel comes down out of heaven and stands on the earth with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And now he's holding another scroll or a book. And he hands the book to John and he says, listen, this book is for you. I want you to eat it. <laughs> When you eat it, it's going to taste sweet like honey, but it's going to turn sour in your stomach. So I guess there's a certain amount of pleasure and goodness that, that, that John's being entrusted with the revelation, but it is not a happy story. It's going to be a sad and violent story. 
So John eats the book, and now he has all the information in him that he needs to tell the rest of the Revelation prophecy. Next, he sees a woman, a beautiful woman dressed in sunlight, standing on the moon and crowned with 12 stars, and she's giving birth to a child, and she's crying out in the pain of childbirth. Now, this is one of two women that appear in Revelation, and she's the good one. She is associated with Judaism and Christianity. The 12 stars are associated with the 12 tribes of Israel. And, of course, the fact that she's giving birth to a child associates her with Christianity and Mary and the birth of Jesus. Beside her is our bad guy, a huge and fiery dragon. And this dragon is meant to remind us of the serpent from Genesis. The dragon wants to eat up the baby. And so a war breaks out and the angels come down and fight the dragon. And the dragon, of course, gets beaten by the angels. And he gets thrown down to earth. And the woman escapes and is taken away on the wings of a great eagle to fly to safety. Well, the dragon's mad because he didn't get to eat up the Messiah, right? So he's sitting on earth and he's mad. And so he decides that he's going to create a bunch of chaos on earth. So the dragon now creates two beasts. One beast that's going to come up out of the water and one beast that's going to come up out of the land. The beast on the water has ten horns and seven heads, and each head is wearing a crown. So, interpreters believe that this sea beast represents Rome and the Roman emperors because they're wearing a crown. And, of course, Rome would be the primary antagonist of John because it's the Roman Empire, right, that threw him into prison. And this is like the classic antagonist of the early church. Now, the, uh, the land beast is said to force all the people on the ground to worship the sea beast, and he forces them all to get what's called the mark of the beast, which is like a tattoo on their hand or their forehead, and the tattoo is the number 666. So that should sound familiar. This is the evil number. Now, people disagree about exactly what 666 represents. Archetypally speaking, it's like the unholy trinity of numbers. Seven would be, of course, the number of God in completion, and 666 is the number of humans and imperfection. And also, we can look upon this dragon and the two beasts as being the unholy trinity. So the good trinity is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the bad trinity is the dragon and the two beasts. All right, now we're coming to the second female character. This, this horrible beast from the water now rides into the land and a woman is riding on the back of this scarlet beast with seven heads and ten horns. And she's dressed in purple, which is a royal color, of course, associated with emperors, and scarlet which is a color associated with passion and maybe even prostitutes. And she's dressed in gold and gems and pearls. And she's holding um, a gold cup of wine and she's drinking wine and she's getting drunk and she's cussing and she's gross and she's horrible. And this character is called the Whore of Babylon. This woman is the evil parallel of that beautiful pure lady that we saw with the sunlight and the moonlight. She is associated with Rome, of course. And being known as the whore of Babylon, we've got some more symbolism going on here. And this is really significant for understanding what the book means. Babylon, if you'll remember, was the main bad guy in the Old Testament. They're the guys who destroyed Jerusalem and took all the Jews and put them into the Babylonian captivity and turned them into slaves. And, um, and eventually Babylon was defeated 
They got conquered by Cyrus the Great, who then let the Jews go back home again. So the whore of Babylon seems destined to lose. And of course, people in John's day definitely hoped and believed that Rome, who they're associating with Babylon, would be conquered just like Babylon was. Now seven angels appear with seven bowls of God's wrath for the earth because God can't take it anymore. This horrible trinity of evil and the terrible whore of Babylon have done enough evil. And so the bowls are going to pour out disease and destruction and earthquake. And the angel's going to throw a boulder at the whore and kill her. And now another white horse appears. And the rider on this final white horse has eyes with fire. And he's wearing many crowns and he's dressed in a robe that's soaked in blood and there's a sword coming out of his mouth and of course this is the same guy we saw in chapter one this is Jesus and he throws the two beasts into the lake of fire but it's not quite the end of our story yet rather than throwing the dragon or the devil into the lake of fire the dragon now gets chained up for a thousand years. Now this thousand years is known as the millennium. And during this millennium, the Messiah gets to reign on earth with the faithful people who never bowed to the beast. And then at the end of the thousand years, Satan is gonna get loose again and start Armageddon, which is the actual final, final battle and Satan's army is gonna try and conquer these faithful few and the Messiah but too bad for Satan, the fire of heaven's gonna strike him down and burn him up and then finally, the dragon is gonna get thrown into the lake of fire along with the beasts. And now this is actually the end of the bad things. Now the meaning of this period of thousand years, this millennium is one of the biggest mysteries of Revelation. I mean, is it in the past or is it happening now or is it in the future? Really as time passes, people keep changing their minds in the Middle Ages, they thought it would be a literal period of a thousand years where Christianity would spread around the world without Satan's interference so people could, you know, get saved. But then after Christianity grew to be older than a thousand years, uh, folks had to change their interpretation. So today there's different interpretations of exactly what that thousand years where Satan would be chained up, this millennium, uh, different interpretations of the millennium. But at any rate, the millennium ends, the dragon, the beasts are in the lake of fire, and now John's attention turns back to the great white throne, and he sees all of humanity, everyone who has ever lived and died on planet Earth, stands in front of him, and he has another book now, where he looks in the book, and in the book is recorded all of the earthly actions of all the people who've ever lived, and each person gets judged by his earthly actions. And then finally, death and hell and all the bad people get hurled into the lake of fire along with the beasts and the devil. And now all the bad stuff, all the bad stuff that's ever existed ever since the book of Genesis and the Garden of Eden is conquered and over. And this brings us to the last chapter of Revelation chapter 22. And I'm just gonna read you one significant paragraph from this last chapter of the Bible. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Now this city is, the, is Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem here at the end of the Bible. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. All right, you see the parallels here between what's happening in Revelation's tree and what we saw with the tree way back in the Garden of Eden in Genesis. It's like bookends to the Bible, a tree at each end. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Okay, remember? The fruit of the tree in Genesis started all the evil, and now the leaves of the tree in Revelation are gonna heal everyone. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. 
They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Okay, this is kind of the opposite of what the beast did with the mark of the beast. These are the people at the end with the mark of God on their heads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. And that is the end of the apocalypse.